thank you guys very much for having me and us. Um, so I'm here to tell you about Dirty Lemon Beverages. I will try to keep this summary brief because I'd like to keep as much time for questions as possible. But in 2015, we launched a direct consumer beverage company. Um, we're the only consumer products company to sell our products exclusively via text message as well. Uh, we developed a technology platform that allows customers to place orders for uh, Dirty Lemon via text message and access the brand at any time with questions or um, really any uh, anything they want to communicate with the brand about. So we've developed a brand new channel of communication for beverage brands. Um, and in a broader sense, it could be used uh, for any really any CPG category. Um, and so it's been almost three years now since we launched the company. We have uh, over 100,000 customers that are communicating with the brand regularly. Uh, we've produced over 2 million bottles of Dirty Lemon since uh, inception. Um, a lot of you guys are drinking Dirty Lemon. I hope that you're enjoying um, the product. We have eight beverages now. So our latest is a CBD beverage that we just launched nationally. Um, we also have matcha, rose, ginseng, charcoal. So basically with the Dirty Lemon products, we're taking um, ingredient profiles or functional uh, ingredients that... Um, that consumers find appealing, and we're uh, blending it with a base of lemon juice, ocean minerals, and sea salt. Um, so at its core, the product is um, fulfilling a need for consumers of function. Um, we're offering full flavor with, uh, with low calorie. All the products have uh, 15 calories or less and under one gram of sugar. So um, yeah, and I'll take you through real quick um, just the inception of the brand and how we got here. I, I've been in the space for about 10 years now. I started my first company in 2008. Um, it was a kid's food company called Little Duck Organics. And we were selling our products uh, in traditional retailers. Started it in New Hampshire. Um, I remember still one day I, uh, I drove up to Durham, New Hampshire, because someone at a natural food store told me that I should meet with uh, a broker, which I had no clue what a broker was. Um, drove up to Durham and I met with a guy who said he could get my products into Whole Foods for 500 bucks. And I was thinking, wow, this is great. I, I would love that. And uh, sure enough, a couple weeks later, he got us into, uh, he presented the products to Roger Perrette. For anyone who's from the old, uh, the old natural foods world, Roger managed uh, like the Boston region of Whole Foods. We very quickly got into um, uh, Whole Foods uh, in uh, in New York through uh, Rachel Forlair, and then we went national, and then we ended up subsequently selling into Target and um, all of the bigger retailers in the U.S. I sold that company in 2013, um, but I was really frustrated uh, through that process um, in that I, I felt like as a brand we couldn't uh, we couldn't present products to consumers that were innovative and get them into their hands fast enough. Um, so we were coming up with all kinds of fun ideas new products, juices, cereals, all kinds of new SKUs. And even if we got an approval from the target buyer today, we wouldn't see the products on store shelves for up to a year. Um, so there's this very long um, long timeline for, uh, for getting new products onto store shelves. So when I was thinking through um, just the, uh, the, you know, how, that, how it could be done better with another brand, um, you know, we thought about direct to consumer because I saw brands like Casper and Warby Parker and all these brands that were selling products direct to consumer without having to worry about retailers. And I thought that that was really exciting, especially as someone that was used to or having to sell into grocery stores. Um, I was always fascinated by beverage. I thought beverage was a really great category to play with. Um, beverages, the beverages that you choose to drink, I think say a lot about who you are as a consumer. Um, if you choose to drink Evian water over Fiji water over Poland Springs, or if you go to Dunkin' Donuts every morning, you're probably not ever going to think to go into a Blue Bottle or a La Colombe. Um, it says something about who you are, and I think people self-identify with the beverages that they drink. So this is a really great opportunity as a direct consumer brand to present a lifestyle that um, consumers find appealing and then um, sell that, obviously, to uh, uh, in a digital uh, format before, uh, before actually uh, giving the product to someone. Um, so a couple quick, I'll try to breeze through this. I know I'm going to probably talk too long, but um, so... The way that our system works is we have uh, distribution and, and uh, logistics infrastructure around the U.S. that allows for same day or next day deliveries in all 50 states. So if you order the product right now, our product right now, you'll receive it tomorrow in most markets, um, which is 
incredibly fast. Um, we're matching Amazon Prime in every U.S. market. And in other markets, we're actually providing faster service than what Prime can allow for. So um, if you have a, a particular beverage that you really like, uh, we want to offer, we, we want to be able to uh, get it to you as fast as possible. Um, and so we spent really the greater part of the last year and a half um, building out uh, the infrastructure to be able to support that. We have, um, like I said, we have 24-7 customer support via text message only, and all of the order processing that has happened to date has all gone over SMS. So we do not sell, we just started recently selling on Amazon more as a customer acquisition channel, um, but every other dollar that's gone through um, the company to date has all been transacted over text message, uh, which is a process that we call conversational commerce, which we think is gonna be the next iteration of e-commerce. Um, we think that the, the connection that consumers are looking for um, with the brand actually happens through face-to-face -face or one-on-one -on -one contact with another person. Um, and we're doing that at scale uh, with hundreds of conversations that we're managing at any given time. Um, so, like I said, 98% of our orders, almost all of them have gone through uh, SMS. And then of the customers that place an order, um, if you place an order today, um, based on the data that we've collected, we have uh, a 60% repeat order rate over a 90-day period. So you're gonna come back to us within 60 days and you're gonna repurchase the product again. And th we're collecting data on consumer behavior and consumption behavior in the beverage space that Coca-Cola, Pepsi, all of the bigger beverage companies have never had access to. Um, so this allows for us to um, expand into multiple brands, multiple, um, you know, we can, we're staying focused right now on Dirty Lemon, but um, the potential here, obviously, I'm sure as most of you can, can tell, is much greater than that, which we're very excited about. Um, and I'll breeze through that. Is this the long deck? Oh no, that's it. I'm gonna leave it opened up to questions now. <laughs> what do you guys got? Um, hi, I'm Sarah with the Chobani Incubator. Um, and we noticed um, following your lead that a lot of our applicants are now going to B2C first. And so the way that we look at this is this is already happening with Amazon and the the preference for the modern consumer has already shifted to delivery at home so as a consumer brand if you want to compete in in the modern uh, the modern market, you need to adapt to that that type of uh, that type of delivery. Um, it may seem unsustainable, but the shipping uh, the shipping infrastructure is is very quickly adapting to this as well. Um, and with multiple warehouses and multiple production facilities, um, I would argue that it's probably actually more efficient for us to be having to have one DC that services an entire city or an entire region rather than ship it to 12 different UNFI warehouses and then have those warehouses put on trucks and go to individual, you know, it's just like that, that system is a mess. And that's what we're, we're working to eliminate the fat that, that it, it exists in the system right now, which is brokerage, retail, and distribution, which doesn't need to be there. It actually detracts from the customer experience. And we're able to, by going direct, actually provide a better, more elevated experience to consumers. Yeah, hi. Um who do you have working on your research and development for new products? You know, to, to just bring you, you have CBD now, you have matcha. Is that is it you or is there like a formulation? How does we, that work? Can you all hear up there? Yes. Um, so the question was, uh, how, who is working on our formulations? Um, we have so the company is split up in two different uh, regions. So our operations and finance team is in Los Angeles. Um, so we have a full team there: food science, um, formulations. Uh, it's not me specifically. What we typically do is we will come up with a level with an idea at a high level. So for anyone here who lives in New York, which I'm guessing most of you do, we had a, um, a pop up last summer called the drugstore in Nolita. Um, and two of the products that you're trying right now were actually concepts that we tested at in a retail setting. So we opened up a non alcoholic cocktail bar in Nolita where we had bartenders making homemade versions of all of the dirty lemon beverages. So we had all of our current beverages being tested, and then we had other new beverages, which is the matcha and the rose that we were testing out. Um, in addition to a bunch of others, we had a bunch of other flavors. Matcha and rose ended up being the best sellers of the new products that we that we had introduced. So we decided to put those into bottles. Um, also, we lend we we lean very heavily on on customer feedback 
just to see what's what's trending. So this was um, before we launched CBD. We went out to all of our customers and said, we should, we're going to launch a new beverage soon. What do you think we should launch? We had thousands of responses come back, and uh, the greater majority of them, we had never said anything about CBD. Everyone said CBD. We were already planning on releasing it, so it worked out great for us. But, um, yeah. So first of all, I want to commend you on your branding. Historically, from little doc to this, I mean, you've been an incredible branding. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that you're homegrown, so congratulations. Thank you. Um, my question is about acquisition. Uh, your model makes incredible sense for uh, building brand trust and loyalty and conversation with your consumers, but, I, but the text message is an incredibly intimate and intrusive an experience for some people. So how do you acquire new customers in a way that they feel comfortable building that one-on-one relationship and driving trial? So everything that we do with SMS is inbound. So we, we don't push messages out to our customers unless they place an order. So anything that's happening, if you're, if you're asking us a question, you're going to get a response back, but you'll never get an unprompted um, message from us saying, hey, buy more product. And if we do send you a message, it's always, this is a rule that we have internally, it's always to offer you something for free. Um, so for example, we had a pop-up uh, on Valentine's Day to launch Rose. It was a one-day flower shop launching our Rose beverage. We had all proceeds going to the Lower East Side Girls Club, which is a really incredible organization on the Lower East Side. Um, we, text, we sent a text message to all of our customers in New York or in the greater New York area, which is about 25,000 customers, saying, stop by the, um, this location today and you can grab a free bottle of our latest beverage. I mean, no one would, it would be silly to be annoyed by that because it's just us like trying to reach out and, and give you something. So, um, so we're very careful of that. We understand that text message is an intimate channel that's typically reserved for friends and family and we wanna make sure that um, that we don't abuse that in any way, which is what happened with email and a lot of other communication channels, telephone and everything else. So. Sorry. Uh, you mentioned two of your pop-ups that you know, you've met at, and I think you and I bonded over what we think is the value of growth is just in real life conversation. Right. And we talk about direct to consumer as being a need for brand builder and you know, kind of business model now. But I think a lot of brands are undervaluing just that, like in real life conversation. So perhaps you can talk about why that is so important to your brand story. Yeah, of course. So uh, what Daniel had asked was, um, why is uh, retail important to our strategy? So we launched on Instagram. It was the only way that you could communicate with the brand other than SMS for a long time. And it was the only, it was the only um, uh, way that we uh, marketed to consumers. Um, that space is changing dramatically. Every week it changes. I mean, we're going through a product launch right now and we're working with some of the biggest influencers in the United States. They're all wonderful people and have and create amazing content, but it's very hard to move the needle, even with some of the most influential influencers. Um, and that tells me that like that things are changing. Um, so what we're seeing is CPA is going up in the and I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question in a, a roundabout way, but um, we're seeing CPA. So cost per acquisition is going up across the board. Our CPA is about three times higher than what it was about a year and a half ago, and. It, our content has only gotten better and the press has only been better on the brand. So it's become very challenging for us to, in, in a cost-effective way, connect with consumers. Um, and then I think just in general, people are spending less time online. Um, not maybe online, but they're spending less time on social media. So I'm sure we all remember like when Instagram first came out, you would take a picture of everything. It was like your food, your your dog, your, you know, it was like just, you just kept taking pictures. Now, you know, you'll take one picture of an event that you go to or something like that. And you post that, um, it's just much, more challenging to connect with, with consumers in the digital space and to retail. So we, we think that curated retail experiences, um, this allows us the, the level of, of connection with the consumers that we were actually hoping to get at scale through social media. Um, we think that that's, in many cases, is not feasible to do right now. So, um, so we're investing heavily in retail. We're taking all of our marketing dollars that we would be spending millions of dollars on Facebook and we're diverting it to retail. So we have a, a new drug store that we're opening up in Tribeca uh, this year and um, we're expanding that to other locations in the US. And it's an incredibly important part of our, our overall strategy because that's the place for us to build community, to have one-on-one -on -one interaction with consumers outside of, and then also uh, attract new consumers. I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done with retail. Um, yeah, so. One of, yeah, one of you guys. Sorry. Um, 
Um, given that the profile of your customer is most likely people interested in like lifestyle brands being uh, healthy, I, I feel like it's fair to categorize them also as caring about the environment. And there's an enormous amount of momentum around uh, plastic pollution right now, and your packaging is plastic. Have you thought at all about shifting to uh, something that's more reusable or being B to C? Ever thinking about like sending it back, going back to like the kind of like milkman model and yep. what that? How that would affect your pricing? Yeah. So the question is around plastic. Um, plastic is, without question, a massive issue that we need to be dealing with as a society. Um, I mean, plastic, while I would love to stay away from it, it's just kind of, it's the, it's the most feasible material for us to use with this product right now. Our next product is going to be glass. Um, it's, we're going to be using it as a tool to attract people to the direct consumer business, um, but we are focusing on glass. And the second part of your question was a return program, which we're working on right now, to include a shipping label with every with every case so you can ship bottles back. Because in my opinion, the issue is not virgin materials, but it's the proper improper recycling of the materials. So um, if we can curb that by making sure that all the bottles that we are producing are going back and they're, it's 100% post-consumer, then that is, I think, the best that we can do at this point in time, given the technology that we have to, um, to you know, help fight the issue. Curious where your distribution centers are to be 24 to 48 hours from anyone in the U.S. So we have uh, one in Dallas, one in Miami, one in Chicago, two in California, one in New Jersey, one in Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, there we have v very small pockets in like Washington State and a few other areas where we can't reach, but we're within all of the uh, all of the main. Uh, uh, distribution hubs for for the shippers that we use. So we use multiple shippers around the country too. Yeah. Um, so it's 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 within one day ground shipping. So the question was, how are we absorbing? For about a year, we absorbed the overnight cost of shipping for the entire year, which was very expensive. But. We're thankfully over that, and now um, because we've increased our, our footprint, we're able to fulfill orders within one day uh, ground for the majority of, our, of the U.S. Do you have any concerns about the regulatory environment around CBD? Yeah, we didn't spend a lot of time on CBD, so thank you for asking. Um, yeah, of course. Like I, I think uh, it's extremely early. Um, we're selling a CBD beverage that's very much a legal gray area nationally. Um, We've taken, I think, adequate protective measures to pr to protect the company legally, um, but ultimately, it's a it's a it's it's a risk factor that we that we've had to make make a decision on as a company to move forward with. I mean, the demand is there, and there's so much uh, power politically behind the movement to to bring CBD to the forefront and start utilizing it for the benefits that that do exist with uh, with taking the ingredient uh, as a supplement. So we want to be there to you know, to support that in any way we can. And yeah, I mean, it's a concern though, but it's something that we're, we're aware of and we've, we've talked to the legal quite a bit about, so. You've been talking a lot about the interrelationship you have with the consumer. You mentioned that you use a on Amazon. Yeah, so it wasn't something that we wanted. So the, the question is, how, do we, how are we managing the relationship with consumers with Amazon as a sales channel? Um, it's an extremely, it's like a necessary evil. We look at Amazon as the new Google, as a new Google. So when you find out of a new, a new product, you're probably going to go onto Amazon, read reviews, check the price, all that stuff. And, um, I think that until that changes, we need, it's a place we need to play. And the, the thing that changed it for us is that people were bidding on our keywords or they were creating knockoff products that were, that said dirty lemon on them that we needed to fight against. So for us, going on Amazon was very much a defensive move because, um, I mean, any product with activated charcoal or, I mean, there was actually a product for a while on Amazon that was called Dirty Lemon that we ended up having to send a cease and desist to because people were searching for Dirty Lemon, they were going onto Amazon, then they were, um, they were seeing a product that wasn't our product. Um, so that type of thing we need to make sure, you know, we're, we're protecting against. And the only way to do that is to, like, be right in there competing. So do we have time for one more? Okay. Uh, when consumers text you, how much of your 
response is automated versus a human at the other end, and how is that staffed? So we have um, full-time 24-7 customer service. Um, so we have a team of customer service reps that's managing conversations. But one thing that we've done is we have a set of, so there's a bot on the front end that handles very common requests. So if you say, hey, can I place an order for two cases of charcoal? We have a natural language processing system that is going to decipher those words and say, you'd like two cases of charcoal shipping to whatever address, correct? And you say yes, and that charges your card and it's done. So you, that, where you know exactly what you want, doesn't need to be handled by a human being. Um, in the case you say, uh, I'd like two cases of charcoal, but can you deliver it to my sister's house? I'm on vacation, blah, 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 like, which happens all the time. Like people are, people ask all types of elaborate questions. That's where the system breaks and it gets pushed to a live customer service rep. But our average response time is, is under five minutes. So you're getting a very immediate response. And the great thing about SMS is that you're not expecting an immediate reply from someone. And if you do, you, it, you, you would think it's a bot or it's a crazy person. So, but anyways, thank you guys very much.